Uh, communication is something which we all understand that we need to have. You know, conversations between friends and family, it's how we build up our relationships. And the only way to create new friendships is to speak to new people. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's impossible to form a relationship with a person without some form of communication. And we understand how we communicate with each other. You know, if I want to form a relationship with Greg, I'll speak to him and he'll speak back and, and we'll bond and grow together. But what about God? How can we communicate with God? It's an interesting thought because God needs us to form a relationship with him, to know him. If you look at John 17 verse 3, it states clearly, this is life eternal to know thee, the one true God. Well, to answer, uh, God speaks to us through the Bible, and, and there are many examples in both the Old and New Testament of individuals speaking directly to angels, you know, messengers that performed God's purpose and relayed his messages. But God no longer uses that method to speak to us. We now have God's entire plan and, and character and history written down for us to read in the Bible. And the Bible is, is the word of God, and it becomes the main way in this day and age to hear what God is communicating with us. You know, 2 of Timothy 3 verse 16 there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the ESV translates inspiration as breathed. It's breathed from God. It's the direct word of God. So if we, hear, if we read the Bible, we can hear the message to us and what God wants to tell us. But how can we respond? It's a one-sided conversation. We have God speaking to us through his word, but how do we respond to God? How can we speak and complete this conversation? Well, prayer is the solution given to us, and it's a way of talking to God. So tonight, although our subject is what the Bible says about prayer, I, I propose a different title, which is what God tells us about communicating with him. And a phrase like that, it becomes a lot more meaningful. You know, as we'll see, prayer is such a great blessing that we should use frequently and, and not turn to as a last resort. It's a wonderful thing that we've been blessed with. So let's begin with the question then, what exactly is prayer? A fairly critical question. Well, if you look at an English dictionary, to pray means to ask, beg, or request. And that's the current English translation of prayer. But the Hebrew and Greek words are much more expressive, much more nuanced. Uh, if we look at the Old Testament here, there are 12 different Hebrew words, all translated prayer in English, and a couple that I thought were particularly uh, nuanced were Job 33 verse 26. He shall pray unto God and he will be favourable, talking about someone who's displeased God and, and how you can then rekindle that relationship. You pray unto God, entreat or burn incense is the word, athar, the Hebrew word. And, and Isaiah 26 verse 16 is another scenario where someone's committed an action against God and the way to rekindle that relationship with God is to pour out a prayer. You know, in trouble they have visited thee. They, they poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. That word is laykash and it's a, it's a sigh or a whisper to God. It's, it's a crying out. The, another one, Job 21 verse 15. What profit should we have if we pray unto him is to meet or intercede. You know, it's the idea of uh, two parties coming together with at a meeting place, you know, two armies maybe having, having a, a treaty and coming together. That idea is brought out in that Hebrew word. And there's, the, there's some more of them. If you look at Daniel, Daniel 6, verse 10 and 11, has two consecutive verses, one after the other, that uses different words. One is uh, zila, to request or bow, and the other is vr, to petition or pray. And, and it, I think... The point of that in that particular verse is it brings out the two different people who were looking at the prayer. One was Daniel, 
who was praying, and the other was noblemen who were looking on the outside and looking at Daniel praying, and they both had different perspectives of Daniel's prayer. Uh, in the New Testament, there are five main words that are used predominantly throughout it. Uh, they, there are three of them, come from the same root word. Uh, we have diomai, eukomai, prosukomai, eroteo, and parakaleo. And they all mean slightly different things, you know, to ask or interrogate, to call for or alongside, I thought was very interesting, you're alongside someone who you're calling on, or to pray or wish. But what's the main point of this? You know, it's, the, the thing is, prayer is a very simple word in English, but when you look at the Bible, the Bible uses many different words, all coming under this umbrella term, prayer. And that's really interesting because it's not just about begging or, or thanking as the English dictionary would have us believe. It, it's a whole relationship and a conversation that's formed around God and us communicating. So if we look at some of the people who've had their prayers directly answered from God, it's clear that anyone can pray to God but for God to listen, we need to have the right attitude. Two examples to consider. Look at Cornelius. In Acts 10, if we turn there. in verse 1 and 2. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Here you've got a person from the most extreme reaches of the Jewish religion. He's a, he's a proselyte all the way from Rome. You know, a, a, a general in the army, a chief man in, in the enemy of the Jews camp, if you will. And, and yet, God, he is a, he's a devout man. He's described as one that feared God with all his house. And he prays to God always. And God provides him with an answer. If, if you continue reading on the chapter, you find that God hears his prayer and sends to him Peter. And, and Peter in, helps him out and ensures that he can come to a knowledge of the truth. Contrast Cornelius, who was praying earnestly and devoutly, with King Saul back in 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. When Saul inquires of Yahweh, Yahweh answers him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, or the priest, nor by prophets. See, God would answer the prayers of Cornelius, a centurion in the Roman army, because he came faithfully before God and earnestly asked for help. But King Saul, king of the Jewish nation, who should be the head of the entire nation, he didn't answer because Saul, if we know from the context, was a disobedient king. He didn't listen to the word of God, and God didn't answer. So back in Acts 10 verse 34, if you turn over the page, you find what Peter sums up, when, and he says, this is the sort of people who God will hear. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. If you fear God and work righteousness, God will hear your prayers. Uh, if we look at Hebrews 11 verse 6 as well, that's another great verse if we quickly turn there. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you want to come to God, you must believe that he is. You must believe in, the, in God and you must believe in his plan and his purpose, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so we, we have really two main methods for God to hear our prayers. God will gladly form this close relationship with us if we come before him 
with this correct attitude, one of humility and faith. And if we seek this relationship with God, God will help us to make it stronger. The more we pray to God, the more our prayers will develop and the more faith and humility we'll have towards our God. But prayer isn't necessarily a particularly easy thing to start, especially if you don't have a background in prayer. It can be very difficult to pray. And the disciples, they clearly struggled with prayer because, you know, they they struggled at least to show the same devotion that Jesus did, often going into mountains or taking time aside to pray. The disciples instead asked Jesus to teach them to pray. If you look at Luke 11 verse 1 on the screen there, they come to him and they say, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. It's an interesting detail because John the Baptist had clearly taught his disciples how to pray as well. It's not an unusual thing that people find prayer difficult. So Jesus then lays a framework for their prayers. If we turn to the Matthew version of this section, which is our reading for this evening, Matthew chapter 6, we can go over it in a lot more detail. Matthew 6 and beginning at verse 5. Uh, Jesus explains how we shouldn't pray. He says, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. This is a specific condemnation on the hypocrisy and the outward show of the Pharisees, the religious leaders in the time of Jesus. And they would stand up in the synagogues or in the middle of a a busy intersection in the main roads of Jerusalem, and they'd pray loudly in the hope that people around them would would hear and and think greater of them. They lost the very purpose of prayer, coming to God for help and for a relationship, in the desire to be seen holy by other people around them. Instead, in the next verse, Jesus tells us as disciples how we really should pray. He says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Well, here we come to a a small issue. Is is Jesus saying that to be heard from God, we need to uh, shut ourselves into our closets and close the door? Well, not entirely. To understand the point of Jesus' commands, we need to look back at what he condemns and what he commends. He he condemns the Pharisees' use of public places to draw attention to themselves and and their hypocrisy. See, they'd lost the point of prayers and were making them about making themselves holy and important. And rather, Jesus says, when we pray, we shouldn't make it about ourselves, but about God. And in verse 7, when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of him. Uh, Jesus makes a real special focus on our prayers, not being about self-aggrandizement, but rather about forming our relationship with God. We're praying to God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So for us to come before him and, and use our conversations To lift ourselves up in in pride is not only foolish, but it's counterproductive. What's even the point of praying to God for help if you think that you can help yourself and by praying you're building yourself up? It it makes no real sense. So Jesus goes on to give a model prayer, an excellent example. Verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus presents this as the perfect formula for prayer. It's a real benchmark, providing us with the sort of things we should include in our prayers. Let's make a rough breakdown 
of the prayer and the elements of the prayer that, that should help us to hopefully build an idea of what the ideal prayer looks like. Jesus begins by addressing the prayer to God, our Father which art in heaven. And using our language, he brings everyone in, you know, his disciples together around the prayer and builds an idea of unity. And he uses the term Father, our Father, to show how our prayers should be expressed like a child to a father, respectful but with love. He goes on, hallowed be thy name. And now this is important because it's a contrast with the previous section, love like a child, in that we've got such an extraordinary relationship. We, our relationship is between us, mortals, and God. And we need to acknowledge that relationship. We've been blessed to talk to God. We need that level of respect. We need to hallow his name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and here we have the first request Jesus puts in his prayer. And it's a request for God to fulfill his purpose. It's a request for God to establish his kingdom. And it's really worth thinking about. What are we praying for and what aren't we praying for? What are our prayers focused on? Do we begin with selfish thoughts trying to pray about ourselves, or are we praying for God, for God's purpose? Jesus goes on, give us this day our daily bread. He acknowledges where our daily bread, where these blessings in our life come from. Uh, think of James 1 verse 17, for example, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Another interesting point Jesus mentions is, is it's for daily bread. He's not asking for riches or wealth. He's asking for daily bread, the necessities in life to tide him by. Continuing on, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If we look at the Luke record, we, Luke tells us what these debts are. He uses the words sins or trespasses. And we need to remember that we've fallen short of what God requires of us. It's a great blessing that we can have our sins forgiven and even come and speak to our God in heaven. Yet Christ reminds us that we should therefore forgive those around us who trespass against us. We, we can't expect forgiveness from God without forgiving those who sin against us. He continues, leading us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When Christ is tempted in Matthew chapter 4 by the tempter, he overcomes that temptation put before him through his close relationship with God. Through prayer and constant study, he'd build this relationship with God. And in his prayer here, Christ encourages us to also seek out this level of relationship with God and to ask, not be afraid to ask God for help when we encounter trials. He concludes, Jesus concludes with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And it's important that we acknowledge in our prayers that we are mortals and we were created by God. And he acknowledges, Christ does, that all things belong to God and are in God's hands. We need to remember that not all that we pray for will come to pass exactly how we may want Yet God promise us, promises us that he will hear our prayers. And Jesus concludes with amen. He finishes his prayer with amen, which simply means so be it in Hebrew. You know, it has the idea of we agree with the sentiments in the prayer. And it's important when we close our prayers to offer them up to God. Are, we, we offer our prayers to God. We need to acknowledge that we are leaving things in the hands of God. We're taking them from our our hands and putting them into the hands of God. It's now up to God to help us to achieve what we need. So Jesus' prayer here is a really perfect basis to start our own prayers. It gives us a great idea of what we should and shouldn't include in our prayers and tells us exactly where our focus should be. It also helps to clarify our dependence on God. God is our Father in heaven and as a loving father he really wants to hear us speak to him yet at the same time his name is hallowed and we can't approach before him 
without the respect that's due to his name. And, and we may call on him for help with the physical things in life, food and shelter and success, but we need to put his plans, his purpose, ahead of our own plans and our own purpose. And Christ forms an integral part of our prayers as well, not just because as we address our prayers to God, we must acknowledge that it's only through the work of Christ that we can come before God. See, in the Old Testament, the high priest was the position given to the chief priest, and it was a mediator between God and the people, allowing the people to speak with God. Uh, today, Christ is our high priest. As Hebrew 4 verse 14 tells us, he's the mediator between God and us, allowing God to hear our prayers. If we look at John 14 verse 6, we read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. That's Jesus telling his disciples. In James 5 verse 14, we learn of the examples set by the apostles and the elders in the first century ecclesia. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the ecclesia and let them pray over him, anointing with him, him with oil in the name of the Lord. That acknowledgement of the role of Jesus in our prayers is critical. So we need to address our prayers through our high priest, Jesus Christ, to our God. Let's have a bit of a consideration, a bit of a consider of the prayers, various prayers throughout the Bible. We're going to jump around the place a little bit and look at a number of verses, some of which are good examples of prayers and some not so good. We should build up quite a picture of what our prayers should look like. And the first example I thought we'd examine is actually two prayers in one spot from one of Jesus' parables, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. We've got Luke 18, verse 10 here. Uh, two, let, let's turn that up. Let's turn that up. Luke 18, verse 10 and 11. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Once again, Christ is bringing out the importance of humility in our attitude in prayer. The Pharisee came before God, the creator of the universe, the creator of the Pharisee, and the ruler of the world, the one who would judge us. And although his prayers addressed to God, in reality, the Pharisee was praying to himself how good a person he was. He was making himself feel good. He wasn't placing himself into the hands of God. He was rather saying, I don't need God. I've got everything I need right here, right now in myself. And you contrast that to the incredible prayer of the publican, short and to the point. He prayed for forgiveness from the sins which he sinned. And this brings up a, a very interesting point about our prayers. It, it really doesn't matter how long our prayers are. Prayer length is irrelevant. And, and rather, we should say or think. What we say or think in our prayers is what matters. Uh, two classic examples of prayers of different lengths, both excellent. Uh, King Solomon's prayer contrasted with the prayer of Nehemiah. In 1st of Kings 8 verse 22, we won't turn there, uh, King Solomon gives a prayer at the opening of the temple he'd built for God. It's an incredible prayer with lots of beautiful sentiment. And, but the, and the prayer goes on for 31 verses. It expresses how thankful Solomon is and the people were to their God for calling them out of the land and their desire that if ever they were to fall to sin, their God would forgive them if they turned back to him. In contrast, if we look at Nehemiah 2 verse 4, Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king of Persia. And while serving, the king notices that he's upset. Let's turn to Nehemiah 2 verse 4. We 
We'll start at verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was brought before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. We've got Nehemiah brought in front of the ruler of the greatest empire in the world, and Nehemiah is his cupbearer, the man chosen to test if there's any poison in the wine. Not a very noble position in the empire, yet an important one. And Nehemiah is put on the spot in front of this king. The king asks, what's the problem? What would you have me do? And Nehemiah gives a prayer. And it can't be a lengthy prayer, because if you're in front of the king of the world, it's not a good look if you sit down and say, excuse me, I'll just say a, a prayer, and then you say a prayer. Rather, it was, must have been a, a quick and a to-the-point prayer inside his head. A and yet, the prayers of Solomon and the prayers of Nehemiah were both fulfilled above and beyond what the people wished. You know, King Solomon was given blessings in abundance, and the empire experienced a prosperity that it hasn't, didn't ever see like it ever again. And Nehemiah was told by the king, all right, pack up your bags and go back to Jerusalem. We're going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. God listens to the people praying and answers their prayers above and beyond what, beyond what they pray for. See, if we genuinely come before God in prayer with faith, our God will listen. And we can pray anywhere too. Solomon was a king praying publicly in front of all of the people in a temple built specifically for that purpose, to worship and to pray, while Nehemiah said a, a private prayer in, in front of the king of Persia. If you have a need, pray to God. And Jesus reminds us in his prayer that God is our father. As a father, he enjoys hearing our voice. On the bus, in the car, or walking down the street, we can and should pray to God. But it's also worth setting aside a time to pray. See, Daniel prayed at the same time every day. If we turn to Daniel 6 and verse 10, we read the story. beginning at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. What's the context here? Well, the king of Persia, a different king of Persia, was ruling, and Daniel was his second in command. And he was a peerless man, unmatched for his talent and his lack of corruption. And the people under Daniel wished to get rid of Daniel. So they set up a meeting with the king of Persia and they organised it that anyone who prayed to a god that wasn't the king of Persia, anyone who prayed to anyone beside the king of Persia for help, was to be thrown in the den of lions. What's Daniel's response to that? When he knows that the writing is signed, he goes straight to his house his windows being open, looking directly towards Jerusalem, and he prays. But the bit I want to take a focus on is the word aforetime at the end, because it means as he'd done many times before, basically. This was not something Daniel was doing in response or something new to Daniel. He'd prayed many times in this way before, and clearly the nobles who wanted to set Daniel up to fail knew this too. You know, it was a well-known fact that Daniel, at three times a day, morning, afternoon and evening, would go and pray in the same spot, looking in the same direction, and they knew to catch him. And 
this is very interesting. It's consistency that sets aside Daniel with his prayers. If we turn over to chapter 10, we'll find another prayer of Daniel's that's remarkable for many different reasons. In Daniel 10, verse 2, we read, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. If we turn over the page to verse 11 and 12, we find it says, And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, this is an angel that appears unto Daniel. Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he heard, had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. The minute Daniel began praying, God heard his words, and yet... God delayed answering Daniel for three whole weeks, but that didn't deter Daniel. Daniel continued to pray day in, three times a day, for three whole weeks, and he mourned and put sackcloth and ashes upon himself, and finally, God heard his prayer and answered him. It's important that we know that we can do the same thing, you know. God knows that we don't always understand things that we read in the Bible. This was the case for Daniel. He'd had a vision in the previous chapter, and he didn't understand what the vision meant. It was a a scary vision. He didn't understand it because it spoke of the destruction and and the return of the land. And and so he he asks God. He says, help me, God. He asks for help from God. And finally, after three weeks, God responds. And if we look at James 1 verse 5, we read, if any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God won't feel angry about our lack of knowledge if we sincerely wish to learn and understand. So what have we learned from some of these examples? Firstly, prayer shouldn't be used as an opportunity to consider, prayer should be used, should be used as an opportunity to consider our faults and the power of God, not for proud boastings. God knows what we need in our life before we pray them for them, yet when we pray, we acknowledge that we're not able to fulfill what we need. God is the only one able to provide for us. Our prayers can be long or short, and they can be anywhere, but they should be spoken sincerely and with thought. And we should try and plan times to pray, times of thankfulness, such as meals or the end or beginnings of days, and in times of reflection to consider ourselves and how we live our lives. We should also try to make prayer spontaneous. You know, when we experience sudden issues, is our first reaction to turn to God? Do we pray? And when we have good things happen in our lives, then do we turn to God? God wants us to build this relationship with him and will help us if we require help If we pray to God for understanding, he wants to give it to us. Let's consider now one of the more tricky aspects of prayer. Namely, why doesn't God always answer our prayers? We can pray to God and we don't immediately have a response. The answer is God does always answer our prayers, but he does have a plan and a purpose with the world. So whatever plans we may make in our life, as important as they might be to us, they take centre stage, second stage, to the centre stage, which is the greatest plan of our great God. So we can class God's answers into roughly three different categories. Yes, no, or wait. And this can be a very painful realisation for us, that sometimes when we ask of God, We can't always get a positive response. It's necessary that God's will be done. Let's look at some examples of people who God said no to. The first one is our Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Before his death, he prays, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Christ, the greatest example, understood this. 
He was going through a terrible torment, stress and pain beyond what any of us can believe. And yet, to him, he understood that the greatest thing that was required was to do his father's will. He knew that God's plan with the earth must be fulfilled. Moses, too, in the Old Testament, was denied a request by God as well. He led the people, children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years, faithfully, up to one point. One point he failed and he gave himself the glory instead of giving God the glory. God achieved a miracle, an incredible miracle through him, and Moses took the credit upon himself in a moment of uncharacteristic lack of humility on Moses' part. Moses, the humblest man who ever lived. He set himself up with an equal to God, claiming the responsibility for a miracle and taking that glory. And as such, God could not allow him to enter the land. Moses, he pleaded with God to let him into the land, but God, though he loved Moses, he, he could not let him in. He said, let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. And you can feel the emotion. God wished that Moses hadn't fallen. He wished that he could have let him enter the, enter the land, but he couldn't. He didn't like the fact that Moses was asking and begging of him. And then we have Paul. Paul in the New Testament. He is given a thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 and 8. Thorn in the flesh, it was a problem that afflicted him, probably medical, perhaps blindness or some other difficult physical injury, which caused him to struggle in some of his preaching work. He couldn't, in his opinion, do his preaching work to his full ability. And he prayed to God three times that the thorn in the flesh might be removed so that he could strengthen his preaching. He wanted to be able to do the work of the truth more effectively. And God has to respond to the prayers of Paul. And he tells him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul's response to that is an example to all of us. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of God may rest upon me. Paul understood that to further the work of the truth, it was necessary that he should experience the pain of the trials. And he rejoiced in it. What an example to us. He, he knew that God's plan with the earth had to come first before his own physical pain. So it may not be in God's plan always to give us what we want in our prayers, yet God does hear our prayers and wants, us, and wants to help us. He really does love us as children. And he's able to do incredible things, as he's done many times in the past when people throughout the Bible prayed to him. Some of you may recognise this slide. I stole it from a youth group event last night. Think of the times God has answered our prayers. He delivered Daniel's friends from the burning, fiery furnace. He restored the sight of the blind to those who came to Jesus. He strengthens us when we pray to him. He makes us a way through temptation. He helps us to understand and stand in times of trial. He raised Jesus Christ and will raise any who have faith in him from the dead. He can and wants to do immeasurably more than what we ask or think. And he is able to present us faultless with exceeding joy, but only if we let him. We need to allow God to act in our lives through faith. So sometimes our prayers are answered with yes, sometimes with no. And sometimes, like Daniel, way back in Daniel 6, Daniel 10, it takes some time for God to answer our prayers. And yet, we're commanded to always pray. We're never told... If God says no, stop praying. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. It's a short section, but there's a lot we can unpack from that. First of Thessalonians 5, and we'll begin at verse 16. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What does God want from us? To rejoice always, to pray constantly, and to give thanks in everything. And praying constantly can be a very difficult thing to start off with. You know, once we begin praying, though, you find the other two tend to fall in line behind it. See, prayer is a wonderful way of adding perspective to our lives. If we, when we find trials and difficulties in our lives, take the time to thank God for what he has given us, the many, many blessings that he's bestowed upon all of us, and quickly we grow to look more optimistic in life. We look at the things around us and we see God working and we are thankful. And the more we notice things that God has given us, the more grateful we can be. And the more we see God blesses us wonderfully. But not only that, but the opposite is true. The more we pray, the more we begin to see God at work in our lives and the more we begin to rely on God when we have difficulties. See, by praying constantly, we not only lay our troubles on God, but we also see the wonderful things God has given us. So it becomes much easier to rejoice at the great things God has given us when we're constantly reminded of how blessed we are and to place our trials in his hands. So we'll begin to draw our evening to a close. We'll consider how we can pray on a bit more of a practical level. See, for many of us, it can be very difficult to pray. But what we need to remember is that God actively wants us to pray to him. He desires us to have this relationship with him. He, he heard the prayers of Cornelius, the prayers of a Roman centurion. He wasn't versed in the ancient prayer techniques of the Jews. He was a, a Gentile from Rome. He also heard the prayers of, of Solomon, the king, a, a majestic prayer, a beautiful prayer, one of my favourites. And the point is our prayers can come in many personal different forms. But a simple method that some of us might know of, and that's one of my favourite methods, is to structure our prayers using our hand. The hand has five fingers, and each finger is a metaphor. So as we pray, we count off the metaphor. The thumb is the anchor. It's the strength of the hand. Without our thumb, all physical tasks fail. We can't grip. We can't hold, we can't lift, we can't carry. It's the most important part of our hand. If we were to lose it, our entire hand would be useless. The thumb represents God. We begin our prayers by considering God, his majesty and his power and his strength in our lives. He is that anchor that holds together whatever we do. The second finger is used to point. Yeah, it it's indicates things, and sometimes they're far away. And, and this represents God's plan. It's, it's his plan and will. We pray that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that God will establish his plan to set up his kingdom. And it represents all manner of things future down the line. Psalm 122 verse 6 tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If we pray and love Jerusalem, we will prosper. Do we pray for Jerusalem's peace? Are we considering future prophecy in our prayers? The middle finger is the tallest finger, and it represents Christ, the only sinless man, our high priest and our king. Uh, Christ is our high priest and allows us to come before God. So we consider what our God has, has achieved in him, the incredible work that he performed in Christ, and, and how he lived his life perfectly. The fourth finger is the ring finger. It represents relationships, those around about us who we, re, we interact with, our friends, our families, our loved ones, those who we care about. So we pray for the health and the safety and the well-being, spiritually and physically. And finally, we come to the smallest finger, the fifth. It's the weakest finger and the least important. It represents us. We can't puff ourselves up in prayer, in pride, in our prayers. We're putting ourselves into the hands of the Almighty God. We're acknowledging we fall short. We can't achieve anything without God. So here we pray that God will help us 
personally in whatever issues we may face and we pray for God's help in our plans and we thank God for what he does in our lives. We, finishing, we finish our prayer by acknowledging that we only came to this close relationship through the word of God, uh, through the work of God's great son, our high priest and king. We acknowledge that it's only through Jesus Christ's name that we can approach our heavenly father. And we conclude our prayer with an amen. So be it. Into your hands we give our prayer, O God. We're leaving the fulfilment in God's hands. But the thing about prayer is the more we pray, the easier it will become. All our prayers, they're different. All of the prayers in the Bible are different. They all have different points that we can add to our own prayers. And they should be, because we are all different individuals and we struggle with different things. Yet, God wants to form a close relationship with all of us. Prayer is such a remarkable blessing and the examples of believers from all across the Bible shows us that no matter the circumstances, we can and we should pray to God and God will hear our prayers. If we approach before him with humility and faith, God can and will form this close relationship with us like a father to a child which he really wants to. Our prayers will develop only through practice and so too will our attitude in life and we can become through prayer better servants to God and so develop to be more like him.